Welcome to Wasa Community Church. We're continuing through the book of Jude today, who's been telling us, watch out for false teachers. Watch out for wolves in sheep's clothing. Contend for the faith, the true faith that has been delivered to us from the scriptures, from Christ, from the apostles, from Luke, the same faith that today we find in the Bible. Right now we're in verses 12 and 13, which give us the metaphors Jude uses to describe these false teachers who have crept into the church unnoticed. He says, these are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame. Wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. So God, I pray that as I am walking through this passage, that as I, as I preach your truth, as I preach your word, that you would be with me in the name of Jesus. That if I say anything that's, that's wrong or untrue, that that would not be believed in the name of Jesus. I do not want to lead people astray. But I pray that your truths in the name of Jesus would be remembered, that they would be clung to in the name of Jesus, and that you would be at work in each one of our hearts in the name of Jesus, giving us understanding of your word in the name of Jesus. Thank you again, Lord, and be glorified in this message in this time. In the name of Jesus, amen. Don't let people wreck their boats. We all know what happens when you're out on the water and you get a hole in your boat. It starts to sink. And that's not good. That's counterproductive. You want to avoid that. Now, depending where you are and what you're doing when that happens, it can even be dangerous. It might just be that you sink in a dangerous place, or it might be the way you hit something that causes the danger. Jude's getting our mind thinking on hitting reefs with a boat or a ship. Hitting one hard enough could be deadly in itself. Or hitting one and not getting to shore, you could find yourself drowning. So reefs, the reefs, they can be dangerous. They can be deadly. Jude calls the false teachers hidden reefs. Hidden reefs. They are unnoticed. They deal spiritual damage and can sink ships. They can sink a church. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear. So they are among the Christians at their love feast, which seems to have had to do with communion. Paul in 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen to 22 talks about wrongdoing in what seems to be a love feast. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in, in part, for, for, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. So when it's talking about the Lord's Supper, there seems to be a meal that's going on. When we think of communion, we think of, you know, the breaking of bread and the partaking of wine or at our church, grape juice. Uh, but here it, it seems like a meal, which we'd probably think of, you know, potluck or a, a fellowship meal, right? A, a church meal. But of course here, what Paul is talking about is more of one that's gone wrong, more of what seems to be a love feast gone wrong, right? It's not potlucky in nature. Everyone just eats their own meal while others who don't have a meal, they go hungry. At one of our normal potlucks at this church, our normal fellowship meals, which we haven't had since March, we bring food to share with everyone, right? With everyone. And there were some times where people didn't feel like they could join us because they didn't bring anything. But that didn't matter to us. It was for everyone. It was for everybody. 
And so we would say, that's no problem. Please join us. You're, you're totally welcome to eat of the same food. We brought this for everyone. It was for everyone. But here in Corinth, they're just all eating their own meals, not caring about the people who don't have their own and who are going hungry. Plus, they take the wine, the, the communion wine, and they get drunk off of it. Like, of course, drinking alcohol is not forbidden in the Bible, but drunkenness is. And this is especially grievous because this is the Lord's Supper. You're supposed to be remembering the Lord. This is supposed to honor the Lord, and you're getting drunk. So things were really wrong here. But anyways, that's just to show that that's probably what would have happened at a love feast, right? And, and so a love feast, it would have been a feast that would have been similar. It would have had similar elements to it as a potluck would if it were a properly done love feast, right? Not, not quite like this, but if it were a properly done love feast. And also, it would have likely included communion. So again, this goes along with the hidden part of hidden reefs. They're hidden amidst the church. They're there when the church is fellowshipping with one another. And their purposes are selfish. The next part of the verse tells us they are shepherds feeding themselves. Now, here it's probably both literal and figurative, right? Because they, they probably don't care for the hungry at the feast, but in the same way, they don't care about spiritually feeding the flock. They don't care about teaching them the essential truths of the Word of God and leading them down the right paths. They only care for themselves. They only care about themselves. And so often, false teachers will just teach what builds them up. Or, or what glorifies themselves, or what sounds good so that the people will like them, though the people themselves are being led astray. They starve the sheep. They starve the sheep. They keep them from partaking from the actual great shepherd of the sheep, Jesus Christ. Jude next tells us that they are waterless clouds swept along by winds. And here... The idea is that waterless clouds are not helpful for growth. And I think that clouds are, are one of my at least top five favorite things about nature. I love looking at clouds. I love the window seat when I'm on the plane so I can, I can look out and see what it's like being among the clouds. I mean, sometimes you just see white. But sometimes you see all these amazing cloud formations uh, from being in them, inside of them, in the plane. And when that's the case, that, that is one of my favorite places to be. Clouds are beautiful. Waterless clouds, they're, they're beautiful. You could say they're, they're attractive. Now, in a natural sense, you could say, okay, well, waterless clouds, when it's really hot out and they block the sun, it brings relief in a way. The heat is, is stopped for a little while. But then I think you're looking too deeply into Jude's words here, past his actual meaning. Of course, waterless clouds and nature can be good. God created them just like he created the reefs. But Jude is leaning on a negative sense here, right? So crops need growth. Rain waters the crops and they grow. But waterless, waterless clouds do not bring growth. And of course, they block the sun, which also helps growth. So the negative aspects of the waterless clouds is that they don't provide help and they block out help. They don't help people grow in the Lord and they block out his light. Their teaching might attract people. Right? Like, like, we're attracted to looking at clouds. Their teaching might attract people. But not only is it unhelpful, it also blocks the truths of God. It blocks them out. It keeps Christians in a place where they're not going to grow. And worse, where they can't find Jesus. Not the true Jesus, anyway. 
The next metaphor Jude uses is fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. Fruitful trees would have produced fruit by late autumn. If they hadn't, it pretty much meant they won't. So these teachers, these wolves, are not bearing fruit. They're not showing that they're really living for Christ. And of course, we know that if they're doing these other things, <laughs> that they're not really living for Christ. They're not living for Christ. So, of course, they wouldn't be bearing the fruit of living for Christ. And they're called twice dead because first, they're, they're dead in their sins. They're not in Christ. They're not producing fruit. But secondly, they're also going to be uprooted. Talking about the Pharisees of his time who always, almost always, uh, turn out to be false teachers, Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 15, 13, and 14, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. These, they're blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into the pit. So this twice dead this second death of the twice dead is to be uprooted. They're dead in their sins. They, they don't bear the fruit of being in Christ. That's the first. And in the end, they're going to fall into the pit. And, and sadly, they will lead their, I guess, sheep into that pit as well. Both will fall into the pit. But this shows that, hey, our Heavenly Father has not planted these people. These people are not godly shepherds. God does not approve of their ways. They may say, you know, God sent me, or, or I speak on behalf of God, but God says, absolutely not. I did not plant you, you blind guides. In verse 13, Jude says about these wolves, these, these blind guides, that they are like, or that they are wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame. Isaiah 57, 19 to 21 says, Peace, peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Wild waves of the sea cannot be quiet. And that's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. Wisdom shows us we need to know when to speak and when not to. Proverbs 17.27 says, Whoever restrains his word has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. So for instance, if you get really mad at someone, you can say some pretty nasty things without really thinking about it first. We should have a cool spirit about us, as it says. We should think before we speak. James 1, 19 to 20 says, Know this, my beloved brothers, but every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Proverbs 17, 28, the verse after the one we read earlier says, even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is deemed intelligent. A fool is considered wise when he doesn't speak his foolish things. You know, at least he's not mindlessly saying nasty things in anger, or at least he's not teaching people his false beliefs leading them astray, or at least he's not telling people how great he thinks he is. But then we have the fool who is not like that, right? The, the wild waves that cannot be quieted, the, the wolves. This is what Proverbs 18 verse 2 says about those kind of fools. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion only in expressing his opinion. I know there are times where we don't understand part of the Bible, and that's okay. I know there's things where I mention I'm not sure, and I say what I think it could be. I, I actually do say my opinion on it. Maybe I also say other opinions and bring them up. 
But I try to understand. I want to understand. But the fool takes no pleasure in that. They might look at, at clear scriptural teaching, like for instance, that Jesus is the only way to heaven. That, that like it says in Acts, there is salvation in no one else. And they take no pleasure in trying to understand that and just say that they think there are other ways to heaven because that's their opinion. It's not scriptural, but it's what they think. And at that point, it's like saying, hey God, I know better than you. I know something you don't. No, teach what God has given you. Teach what God has given you. It reminds me of something Jude said about uh, the false teachers earlier as well, where he said these people blaspheme all that they do not understand. All that they do not understand. There are certain things you can give your opinion on, but try to understand the Word. Do your work in studying it and in trying to understand. And of course, we should be praying for understanding. We should be asking for help from the Holy Spirit that's been in us since we've been in Christ. I think actually the most important thing about teaching the Bible is the prayer that goes into it. We've got to be relying on God. We've got to be relying on God because if God's not involved, if God's not at work in the hearts of your hearers, then nothing fruitful will come from your teaching. Now, these false teachers that Jude is talking about would not be in Christ, right? So, so that's a problem to start with. They're not actual sheep, remember. They're, they're not actual shepherds. They're wolves. They just have sheep's clothing. So they don't have the Holy Spirit. But either way, there seems to be a heart issue where they don't care too much about understanding what the Scriptures say. And they take their opinions in a different direction and are not quiet about it, right? They teach it. They teach it still. Someone might point out, hey, but the Bible says this. They would likely just ignore that. Another proverb, and I love this one. <laughs> Proverbs 30 Verse 32 says this, If you have been foolish, exalting yourself, or if you have been devising evil, put your hand on your mouth. God's advice to those who in pride talk themselves up is put your hand on your mouth. <laughs> put your hand on your mouth. And that should be advice to, to really any of us who exalt ourselves. But in the context of this message on Jude, that should be advice to any false teacher about anything wrong that they teach. Put your hand on your mouth. Whether it's exalting themselves, whether it's giving opinions contrary to Scripture despite it being from Scripture, whether it's speaking out nasty things in anger when they're not, when they're not slow to speak, this is a problem. This is a problem. And bad things come from it. Isaiah told us about the waters of the wicked that would not be quiet. What did they produce? They tossed up mire and dirt. Jude says here that they cast up the foam of their own shame. Good things do not come out of this. Earlier in the letter, we've seen blasphemy, selfishness, sexual immorality, the love of money over God, unbelief, abuse of God's grace. And if unnoticed, that can stir these things up in the congregation that they've crept into. And that's dangerous. It pushes people further from Jesus. The last thing Jude says in verse 13, is that they are wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. So, of course, they get punished unless they completely repent and truly put their faith in Jesus. But if not, they are punished with an eternal punishment. And of course, like we said about the blind leading the blind, they lead people astray to the same fate. That same fate. Now, about them being wandering stars, it's like they're shooting stars. 
And again, that, that's beautiful, right? A shooting star, a natural shooting star is great, at least to, to see in the sky. But here, it's likened to the false teacher because he's got his short time on earth of brilliance, and then he fades away into the darkness, the eternal, gloomy darkness. People might love him in this world. He might get riches in this world, but that's his reward. A tiny sliver of time that was good rather than an eternity of good. And that's the deception of the devil. You know, look at all that's around you. You can get so much out of this life. Who even knows if the next is a guarantee? Work for this life. And it's tragic. It's tragic. And we listen to that. We trust ourselves rather than God. It's tragic especially when it works its way into the teaching of the church because then deception spreads among the congregation and then more people are led astray. We need to stick to the word of God. We need to contend for the faith that is in these pages. There are people all over, even us sometimes, that have been influenced by the teachings of hidden reefs. People crash on those reefs. They get swept up in the unquiet waves. We need to help people navigate around those reefs so they don't end up sinking, which is why it's important for us to know our faith. Right? It's, hard for, it's hard for us to contend for faith that we don't know much about. So keep studying your Bible. Be, be praying for the Spirit to be helping you understand the words as well, especially the basics, the gospel, that we were sinners in need of Jesus, that Jesus died and rose again for our sins, and that we need to place our faith in Jesus and what he's done, and that that's a faith that includes repentance. But there's more in the Bible than just that to study and know. There really is. And we need to be aware of those things. Because false teachers, they might know this basic stuff, and talk about it. But other things they might say may make you go, hmm. Right? Because, again, they're, they're, they're unnoticed. They're probably not open about their denial of Jesus. They might not even know they're denying Jesus in their heart. And so when we hear teaching online or on the radio or on TV, we should be thinking. We should be thinking. Even listening to me, be thinking. Be thinking about what I say. I'm not perfect. I could say something wrong. I mean, I am in Christ, but it's, it's good to think about what I'm saying, right? Don't just take my word because I'm in Christ. Take my word if it lines up with the scriptures. And so with that, yes, people in Christ can get it wrong. So, so we've also got to be careful about jumping straight to saying they're a false teacher when maybe it's just something that they're teaching that they're wrong on. And, and I'll say this, right? I have not found a preacher that I've agreed with 100% on everything they say, on everything they've taught. And there are some people solid in their faith, in their view of Scripture, who have said things in ways where I've thought, um, was that said out of anger? We're human. We're human. However, if someone becomes defined by these things, if it's super regular and if they're off about the essentials of the faith, that's cause for concern. So we've got to be thinking. We've got to be thinking. We might hear something that's a little bit off and that might raise a red flag in our head and make us think, hmm, I should check. Is that really what the Bible is saying? Do that. Check. Always check if it seems off. Check. But as we grow in God's word, his truths become more familiar to us. And if we hear something on TV or, or maybe we, we have a friend tell us something that's a little bit off that they may have heard somewhere, we should question it. And in the case of a friend or, or someone you know, talk about it with them. 
right? right? Ask them about it. Look into the scriptures with them. All in gentleness. All in gentleness. We don't want to say, how could you believe that, <laughs> right? We want to do it in gentleness. Ask them about it. Say, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure about that. Maybe we should look at that, you know? The more we grow in God's word, the more things jump out at us. And, and the better we're equipped, the better equipped we'll be to contend for the faith, to navigate around those hidden reefs and to help others navigate around them as well. Don't let people wreck their boats. Bow with me in prayer. God, you are wonderful, you are amazing, and you've given us such an amazing truth. You've revealed us to you. You've revealed to us yourself. And thank you for that, Lord. You are wonderful, you are amazing. And uh, help us to be able to discern what's right and what's wrong in what we hear. Also, just in general, but about what we hear as well. And I know those things work together. Um, but please give us discernment. Um, help us to study your word. Give us a hunger and thirst after your word in the name of Jesus. And help us to study it by your spirit, leaning on you for understanding. Help us to understand your word. Help us to dig into your word. Help us to really study it and want to study it in the name of Jesus so that we can be equipped to address certain things, to have things jump out, of, jump out at us that aren't right and help us to respond to them in wisdom, in, in, a, in a wise way. You know, if, if they make us angry, help us not to just all of a sudden go and say some nasty, angry thing, right? Lord, help us to... Um, wisely react to these things in the name of Jesus as well. So, yeah, thank you, Lord. Um, be with us as we go out from here. Um, well, we're not in, in the church building, but as we continue with our lives, be with us in the name of Jesus. Be with us as we continue our lives. Be with us as we talk to people um, about you, um, as we hear different things um, from different preachers, and just help us to be on guard. Help us to be on guard. In the name of Jesus. Amen. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.